Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guests today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. We're back with your bite-sized business advice at lunch. I'm super excited for this one. We have, I always talk about on this show, it's mind, body, business, and we're going to definitely dive into the overlap of mindset and business today with a high-performance coach. So before we go any further, let me welcome James Burnham to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me, Brandon. I, I honestly was uh, super excited. We bumped into each other in a group meeting and you were like, come come on my show. And I'm like, damn, I would love that. So appreciate the invite and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I said uh, I said word for word, come come make mistakes on my <laughs> show. <laughs> that's exactly because, right. because we're all we're here to have fun and be authentic yeah. and be real. And that's what this show is all about. So thanks for playing. I appreciate that. But this is about you and what you're doing. And I actually find what you're doing fascinating because I don't meet a lot of like literally quote high performance coaches. Everybody's a coach. Everybody's a consultant. Everybody's in in this field. But when you specify high performance, that's a different level. So in your words, I'm curious, what's the difference between being a regular coach and a high performance coach? You know, um, I think the difference is, is there, there are many people that have achieved what from the outward view would be considered success, right? You're making good money. You have a nice home. You're, you're living a lifestyle that everyone would look at and say, oh my gosh, I want that lifestyle. And what I have discovered is most people in that situation are still feeling as troubled as they did when they were not in that place. The internal feeling does not match the outward view. And, and when that is there, right, and, and we all face this, there's nobody that's free of this. But when people get to that place, there's a point. I remember I used to work with, in my mind, I had a number. And I remember at first, when I first got out of, um, got out of college with my first degree, I was like, if I could make $50,000 a year, man, I would be awesome. I could just relax and be myself. And I hit that number. And then I thought, well, if I could make 100 and I hit the number and, you know, it just kept going up. And it was, uh, you know, th- I, I can't remember exactly the number was that I hit. But when I hit it, I realized this has nothing to do with a number. This has everything to do with me. And I've got to figure out me first. And that's what high performance coaching is. Because when you tap into a different way of motivation, an internal perspective that that is not outwardly driven and not self-flagellating your whole perspective on happiness and enjoyment and fulfillment changes and you can face the same load of work and have a completely different energetic take from it Mm, that's you know that's really interesting too because i feel like from the outside like you said you you look at people and like those are successful people like they got they got their stuff together and then almost every time, because I've had these conversations too, they're they're broken, they're beating themselves up. They're they have the same inner dialogue that you and me have, us us normal folks, right? Yeah. So how do you get through to them that this is the approach you're taking rather than just getting them to that next number in their head? Yeah, I, I think you have to have some self-introspection to be able to get there, right? You're not, there, there are going to be people that will run that you know, rat race the rest of their life. They're just going to stay on that spinning wheel and grind and grind and grind into oblivion. And it's bad for your health, mentally, physically, emotionally. And you see them, right? We, we all see them. And, and hopefully, as you hear this, you see them in yourself because we all have them too. We're, we're never rid of them. What we do is we learn to process what's there. And it comes down to emotional understanding of what's going on and listening to your emotions. That's where I approach it from. So uh, um, if you're listening, I mean, I think part of you might want to say, hey, there's got to be a better way to achieve what I'm achieving. And uh, if that's you and you've achieved really high levels of performance using the techniques that you have, but it's you're finding you're not satisfied, you're not <clears throat> you're not energized, you're feeling depleted. There's a sign there to me that you are 
using old modalities of performance, survival modalities of performance that have achieved high levels for you, but these are not thriving modalities. And most of us stay in a survival mode. That's a wake up call, I think for <laughs> definitely myself, but also for a lot of people listening, because we're so used to just business as usual, right? Yes. And, and hoping we get different results. I think Einstein said doing the same thing and expecting different results is the definition of insanity, which is, you know, that's a foundational principle to business. Yeah. So when you're working with your clients, um, well, before we get to you working with them, I'm curious, like, what are people like when they approach you? Like, what's their, what's their mindset? What are they really looking for? And then how do you kind of indoctrinate them into your process? So I really like to work um, with leaders and leaders always have a team. And um, what I've found is a leader can transform not just their own life, but they can transform the lives of everyone that's with them. And so the impact is, is like 10x, right? When you work with a good leader that's ready to do this. And I would say, you know, the guys that come to me, I had a guy come to me and he said, you know, I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life. Um, he had a small business a team of six and he's like, but I'm more stressed and more overloaded than I have ever felt. And I'm less happy than I was when I was like putting everything on my credit card, hoping that my next deal would give me out, get me out of debt. And, uh, that's a sign, right? That's a sign that you are taxing yourself. And, and what happens with these guys is you know there's a distinct difference it's really interesting this happens in big companies too that people do this but there's a distinct difference between say a c-level executive and a mid-level manager in that the c ceo and the other c-level executives they work as a team if they're good and the cfo was not going to walk into the ceo's office and say you know what so and so did this to me and they did it and i got this problem and i need you to solve it and they're going to walk in and they're going to say, hey, you know what? I've run into a problem. I'm having a bit of a relationship issue with this person. I'm working on these things to try to solve it. What do you think? And that changes the nature of the game. And the way the corporate, large corporate structure is built, it insulates the top leader from all of that drama. But a small businessman or small businesswoman has been the rainmaker of that business from the inception. And they have problems of letting go of things and handing them off to the talent that they've hired. They have problems um, not solving every problem and flipping it back because they, they are so used to being the person that does everything, they're still doing everything. And it leaves them taxed. But when you, have a, when you begin to shift that, it changes everything for you because you now have a team, you have to let go of a lot of stuff and frankly, that's the big issue between the transition that leaders want to make that are small businessmen, particularly if you want to go from making good money and having a good life, you know, like financially good life to an abundant life that is full of happiness and energy and support, you have to let go of some things. And that's hard. It's hard to do when you've built something yourself. Yeah, we, I think we tend to identify as it too, right? Like I, I am my business up to a certain point until you start to delegate and let go. And what I've found is in working with, with our clients, there's, there's three distinct revenue ranges where this transition really takes place. It's the, the hundred thousand to a million. You can get away with holding on to things, yeah. but, and you really have to focus on systems if you're going to get out of it from a million and beyond the one to 10 million range. If you're not solely focused on leadership and delegation and building an immensely powerful team, you will never grow your business. And honestly, that's where most people fail. They cross the barrier. They have the bad habits of before and they don't release them and their identity is still the business. Yeah. So that this seems like where a very natural fit for where your services would come in because that's like the, the make it or break it phase, right? I'm curious, is that typically what you see in your clients too? Yeah, that's exactly it, right? Like you, you can just get to a, a million dollars in revenue a year on sheer grit and determination, and then you'll try to bump up. And what I see is guys will get up to like three million and drop back. It's just this yo-yo, and, yeah. and they're trying to buck past the ten million mark. You can't. 
You cannot do it with sheer willpower. I mean, I suppose people do, but it's a rarity and it's not comfortable. Yeah, definitely not. So then walk me through it, when when you start working with people, what is the process? I would assume you have to break them a little bit first of their mindset and then take them through increasing their, their leadership and, and becoming a high performance leader. How do you do that? Well, um, that's, that's, so do you want to know how you become a high performance coach or do you want to know how to break through with the client? That seemed like a double, double question to me. Maybe what, maybe both. No. So how do you, if you're working with somebody, how do you get that? Like, what is your process to work with them? I, not for yeah. becoming a coach, but yeah. for them to make a change and actually increase their business, grow their business. How do you do that? So um, I need I need the client themselves to recognize that there's some pain points within their business that they want to change. Right. And, mm -hmm. and what I specifically focus on I, my big package is 90 days to a drama free workspace. That's what I'm, I'm offering. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to create a work environment that is yours. And what I typically see is leaders are not making a cultural imprint on work. And I'll hear things when I'm talking to somebody, they'll say, well, I've got this staff member that uh, is causing problems and they've been with me from the beginning and I feel deeply loyal to them. And I really appreciate the service and we're moving up to another level, but now they're causing a lot of these problems and they're not changing and I need them to change, but I, I can't fire them. And so you hear that and it's like, well, why can't you fire them? You're the boss, right? And and what this comes down to is an emotional awareness. So there are things that have been building as you grow and as you go after stuff, you get so busy, caught up in that, you begin to neglect your emotional intelligence. And what I mean by that is you know that there are things that you should do. You feel them and you avoid that pain because you're worried about the possible consequence of pursuing that and maybe losing a valuable person in your in your team and you need them. And how do I replace them? And all these fears that come up, all of that stuff keeps you from actually looking at the source of your pain. And it is very natural instinct, right? The, the, the way the brain works, we're ignited by all of these things that are different, that are wrong, that we are default mode ignited to avoid fight or you know, freeze when we see these types of things happening. And we do it in every way in our lives. And if we're not aware of it, well, we're all aware of it. But if we're not focused on it and looking at it, it builds and builds and creates pain. And so I capture the people that are in the point of pain where they're like, I have got to look at this. How do I fix this? And so then we go in and uh, it's very typical for me to work with a team and for one of the team members to end up leaving. I, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it's not uncommon because now the owner, the leader is making a culture that is ideal for them and the climate for them. And that imprint on that culture will bring talent to you that wants to be with you. It will get better engagement out of the team and it leaves you left with energy at the end of the day so you can go home and actually have bandwidth to enjoy your family or your personal life. That, yeah, that's so huge. And I, I was actually, when I got into this line of work out of selling my other business and, and into fractional COO work, I was surprised honestly by the number of people who left when you install a new operating system and a new culture in a company. So we work with the leaders <laughs> as well. And um, I remember one of one of the earliest ones that we worked with, we totally redid their their mission, their vision and their core values. And the way we use core values is it's a filter. It's how you hire. It's how you fire. If you don't stick to them, you really don't have them. And she presented them to her team and a couple people left. And it, I mean, it was a big team. It was like 40 plus employees. But then on the other side of that, she had a number of people step up and yeah. who said, I had no idea this was like the culture that we have here. Like I'm ready. This is what I signed up for. So it's, yeah. it's, it goes both ways. You have people who you push away, but also people who you attract, like you said, with both internally and in hiring. I'm curious how you take that approach from you're working with the leader. Do you ever go down and work with the team to optimize them as well? Yeah. So part of my process, the very first thing that I do is I do a 360 of everyone on the team. 
So not everyone. I do a 360 of the leader and I interview every single person on the team. Okay. And then I hear, because there's going to be a lot of noise. Everyone complains and that's okay. Um, Cause we all complain about stuff and you need a space to let that go. But amongst all the noise, you begin to see patterns of repetition and that's where your truth lies. And so we get a, a template of where this leader can then actually make effective change within the culture and they get to decide what that culture is. They, they get very clear on what it is they want and what they need. But the, the foundation comes from that first 360. And then we build a plan in conjunction. I always make the leader do this because I'm your coach. I'm not, I, I, I learned from consulting that it's very easy for me to come and insinuate myself between you and your team. And then your team is relying on me to convey information to you. And that's dysfunctional. I don't want to triangulate anything. Yeah. So everything I do comes through the leader. And then we implement a whole bunch of, you know, basic techniques that everybody can do and improve. There's no company that can't improve by these things. But with the personal imprint of the ideal culture that that leader wants to place on that team. And that's the watershed moment, right? You'll have players step up, you have players leave. And, you know, I had a dentist uh, I was working with and he is hiring a hygienist in dentistry right now is just agony apparently can't get them and so he had a hygienist that was problematic but he didn't want to lose her because it's a huge hit on his income if he can't provide those services and he's like i can't lose this girl and that that's where he came right and i said well let's do this and you're probably going to lose somebody you won't have to fire them they'll likely leave on their own um but let's see what happens and i promise you it'll be better for you and you'll attract the type of people you want once you have created the environment. So we did the process and he lost his hygienist. And this it was over last year and he called me um, in November and he said, you know what? I still haven't been able to replace that hygienist, but I'm $200,000 more in revenue at this point in the year than I was at the end of the year last year. And that's without a hygienist. And my team is better. We have way less drama. I'm enjoying my work more and I still want a hygienist, but man, I can't believe it, you know? And I was like, there you go. Proof in the pudding, right? Yeah, that's cool. I think a lot of people, they don't realize two things. This is what I find. I'm curious to hear your thoughts and then we'll wrap this episode up, but they don't realize that you can design a culture when you're the business owner, first and foremost. And then they don't realize that cultures are magnetic yes. and keeping in mind that magnets have a positive side and a negative side. You will repel people and attract people. Yeah. And those two things in combination can either kill your business or take you to that next level. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. Yeah, we're we're totally on the same page on this. Yeah. I love it. This is awesome. So here's what I'll say. You're, everything you're saying resonates. I, I absolutely love it. I agree with it 100%. I'm putting myself back when I was in in the position of someone who would approach you a few years ago and fear comes up. The, the yeah. first thing is like, oh boy, if I work on myself and I start losing people, like I'm already working too much. What, what if, what, what if it all fails? Right. So, um, how, how do we go about that process? I think you have a very interesting way of introducing this topic to people. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> uh, it's funny how you, uh, you nail that, you know, so, so perfectly, cause that is the place I start, right. I, I examine fear. And so emotions are something in our culture that we have historically been very bad about dealing with. We have we are living truly uh, in a survival society. You know, we we perform at a high level. We have what you would consider luxuries that take us out of survival, but our mentality is still survival, and that is reactionary. We're reacting to things, and that is a fear-based modality, right? And so some people don't recognize that they're in fear, but if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're avoiding things, if you're procrastinating, all of these things are fear. This is your, you know, base brain style reaction. It is the first thing that confronts you. And when we tend to avoid it because we've been taught to, we lose all the capacity to navigate through these tricky situations. Our emotions are what I call our sixth sense. They are what allow you to gather the information around the world. And if you listen, there's wisdom. If you don't listen to your emotions, 
They get louder and louder until all you hear is the delusion of them. And that's when you see people freak out and break down and become crazy and trigger, right? They're not in the moment. They're reacting to a years of withholding, right? So I actually have a pop-up podcast that will deal with this. And um, it's called How to Know If You Are In... Oh, sorry. I'm forgetting the title. I just put the title together. <laughs> the pop-up podcast is How to Know If You Have Drama in Your Workspace, right? And that comes down to the leader. And, and so you begin to look at these things, these evidences there. And then I have a template in within, it's a three episode thing. And I'll provide a template within there that teaches you how to metabolize fear and turn it to excitement. Because fear is inevitable. People say, I want to live without fear and cut your head off. You can't. I don't. <laughs> but what you can do is you can learn to receive it, hear it recognize it for its validity or not, and then metabolize it to excitement and take an approach that will transform your life. Right? That's so cool. Talk about suppressing emotions. If you, <laughs> I think a lot of people, when they have drama in the workplace, they want to just look the other way. It's like, no, yeah. that's, that's over there. That's not my thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's where all this stuff really tends to start, especially when you're moving up in company size and, and between those levels. So that's really cool. I'm, I'm excited to check that out. Um, we will have the links in the show notes down below. So make sure you go download that three-part series that James was just mentioning and take the first step. Make sure you can optimize yourself and your team before you start growing your business. Because if you don't, it's going to fall apart. I've seen it firsthand. So I'm just going to give you the, the spoiler alert. That's the end of the story. Um, so make sure you don't make that mistake. James, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for being here. Um, is there anywhere we can follow you online and, and follow your journey Others, other than the podcast? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel just like you, um, uh, and it's uh, James G. Burnham is my YouTube channel um, on Facebook and Instagram as well at James um, Burnham. James G. Burnham is my Instagram. Um, so you can check out those links as well. I, I kind of post all the same stuff on the, on the platforms. That's awesome. Well, thank you again for joining. And just as a little teaser for you watching and listening, first of all, Thank you. We love you. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, if you go to James's YouTube channel, there's a really cool interview he told me about before we started recording. So that's all I'll say on that. But go check him out. Go subscribe and download that podcast in the show notes. Thanks for listening to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. So fantastic to have you here. We'll see you on the next one.